What is going on, everybody? Welcome to the Fight Dialogue. My name is Tim. This is the second tier list video I decided to make, and it is on the illegal strikes of MMA. And basically, what I'm going to be ranking here is what moves would serve you best and which moves would be the most useful if you were in a no holds barred fight or a street fight, if you will. So what are the most effective illegal techniques, basically? I know it's a little bit of a, a weird one, an abstract one, but we're gonna have fun with it. So let's get right into it. All right, so I got my tier list here for illegal techniques of the sport of MMA. And we're just gonna cut right to the chase. The first one that I'm gonna do is the one that we're probably the most used to at this point that we've seen is most common happens on accident all the time and that is groin strikes let's see i mean if you were to use groin strikes um in a real fight or in a in a no rules fight i think they would be pretty useful any guy knows when you get hit to the balls it's not fun. Even if you just get lightly hit there, it's gonna make you definitely second guess what your next move is gonna be. And you're gonna have a hard time being truly effective in a fight if you're in a large amount of pain. And if you get hit there really hard, then it is you know, completely debilitating. You're gonna double over in pain and you're not really gonna be able to defend yourself effectively. The problem with dick punches is that it's, not exactly an easy target to hit and it's only truly very effective on one gender i don't know how bad it hurts for a chick to get hit in that region but i can tell you it hurts way more for a guy so given that there's a very obvious stipulation for how effective it's going to be against certain people i would put it at a solid b tier b tier for the dick punches all right next is scratching any kind of scratching clawing and i'm not talking about the eyes we'll get to the eyes shortly but i'm talking about like scratching of the flesh i guess now this is technically an illegal move in mma but honestly the trade-off is horrible you're gonna do a very minimal amount of damage for a large amount of effort even if you got like super long uh like girl nails you, you're not going to do much damage and in fact you're probably going to break your own nails or bend them backwards so you're going to do more harm than good so i'm going to put scratching and i got my picture of this little cat with his scratching post here at f tier f tier for scratching all right next strikes to the spine um i suppose it depends on what type of strike you're landing on the spine and and also like what part of the spine are you landing on is it like you're punching somebody in the back of the neck or you're punching somebody in their lower back. I guess it depends. Um, but even still, like let's go worst case scenario, you are kicking somebody in the back of the neck. It's probably gonna hurt. It's definitely gonna hurt. I mean, if your neck is kind of fragile or you have some kind of pre-existing condition in your spine, like you might, you know, you, you could get a a herniated disc from being kicked there you could potentially break somebody's vertebrae by kicking them there or you know absolute worst case scenario you could paralyze them which is of course really really bad but i i can't see that happening anywhere near on a consistent basis and that's if you're using the most powerful part of your body to kick the most vulnerable part of the spine so although it it can do some damage under the right circumstances. I don't think strikes to the spine are that devastating, so I'm gonna put them at a D tier. While we are on the subject of spines, uh, let's go for spiking. Spiking is like, it's like a pile driver when you lift somebody up by their lower body and drop them down on their head, like straight on top of their head. At least that's the way it's worded in the uh, unified rules of MMA is like you're not allowed to drop somebody and spike them on the top of their head um, if they land on their shoulder or something weird like that or if they they come at like a bit of an angle or if they land on their face even i think it's technically not considered spiking and here i have a picture of nate marcourt spiking somebody i think he actually spiked uh alan alan belcher maybe or maybe uh, patrick cote it was one of those guys, and whoever it, whoever he did it to um, definitely complained about it, but I think it ended up 
like not being considered a pile driver. But um, as far as like effectiveness goes, um, yeah, it's potentially dangerous, but to get somebody to land like completely on top of their head or on their neck perfectly is pretty difficult. Like it's a very um, labor intensive technique. There is a fair amount of strength involved. You really got to engage your lower back muscles to kind of lift that guy up because it's, it's awkward to lift somebody like that. You can't exactly use your legs for power like you normally would with a traditional wrestling technique because you're kind of hunched over the guy and the guy's arms and head are down by your legs. So you have to kind of like hunch over them. The act of picking a person up like that is quite difficult. And then to get them to land uh, in the way that you're trying to get them to land is also very difficult. Um, I do think it can do some damage, especially if you're fighting somebody on pavement or concrete, but it's not, it's not the best, it's not the best move out there. So let's put spiking also at a D tier. Next, uh, let's go with hair pulling. Um, it may not seem like the best of moves, but the interesting thing about hair pulling is, especially if the person has a lot of hair, that gives the person doing the hair pulling a lot of leverage over the other individual's body. So a common theme that you see in grappling is if you can kind of control where the guy is facing, or if you can control where the person's head is turned, you can, generally speaking, control where the rest of their body is going to go because you can't turn the opposite direction of where your your uh, head is facing at least uh, at least not completely you know you can obviously turn your head this way and that but there's an extent to how far you can turn so if you can control where a guy's head is is going and facing you can take their back you can set them up for uh, punches and strikes it gives a it gives a fair degree of control and it just it you know it hurts it's annoying um, you know, nobody's going to tap to hair being pulled out. So I guess in that sense, it's a very, you know, shitty move, but it does set up other things sort of off topic, but like Vikings, you know how like Vikings have the horns on their helmets, or at least that's how they're always depicted. Yeah. In real life, they didn't really have horns on their helmets because the amount of leverage it gives the people that they're fighting is just absurd. If their horn gets clipped by a sword or somebody decides to grab their helmet and then chop their head off, like nobody's going to be walking around with actual horns on their helmets. It's just silly. It's the same premise with hair pulling. Um, if you can get a clump of hair and just kind of ragdoll a guy's head around, you can really uh, do some damage. So I am going to put hair pulling at C tier. And I got my little picture there of Hoist Gracie pulling on Chemo's head. So that's just testament to its effectiveness. Let's go with some head butts now. I got this picture here of Khabib Nurmagomedov. He was a lot younger in this picture, and he's headbutting the crap out of a guy while on the ground because in this particular MMA organization, it was a legal move. And in that fight, you can look it up. It's on YouTube. He was actually pretty effective uh, with his ground and pound by using the headbutt. It's especially effective when you're in you know kind of stuck in the guy's closed guard and you're trying to get him to open up so that you can pass give him a couple headbutts and uh you know he'll he'll let you pass right away i'm sure it's also a very common theme in lethway uh, which is a sport that's very similar to muay thai except the fighters compete bare knuckle um there's a couple uh like knockout rules that i'm not crazy about but also you can throw headbutts and again, it's a it's a strike that's very effective when coupled with grappling. A lot of times when you watch Lethway and you watch them land headbutts, it's from the clinch. It's a very short range shot, probably even more short range than the elbow for obvious reasons. So you kind of have to be in tight to land the headbutt. It's not really possible to land a long ranged uh, headbutt unless you just launch yourself at the person and they stand still. So it's kind of practical in some situations. 
um, not so practical in other situations. It's not like this all-encompassing move that you can do whenever you want. And I mean, there are very few moves that are, but there are some moves that are more versatile than others. And I would say that this one is less versatile. Not only that, but you can potentially seriously hurt yourself by throwing headbutts. You could potentially do damage to your own head, your own skull. Uh, you could cut yourself on the head by throwing headbutts. And it's probably not good for the integrity of your brain uh, long term. So, so although it does have its uses, I'm probably going to put headbutts at a B tier. Headbutts for B. All right, let's go to another one that is a hot topic in MMA right now. Uh, strikes uh, using the legs, so knees and kicks to the head of a downed opponent. And of course, there's different rule sets in MMA. There are some organizations where it was legal. In this picture, I have Shogun kicking some Japanese guy in the face because in Pride, it was a legal move. In 1FC, I believe it's legal. But in, I would say, most uh, MMA rule sets, it is not a legal move. And it also varies depending on what the organization or the athletic commission considers a downed opponent. Sometimes it's one hand on the ground. Sometimes it's two hands on the ground. It all depends. So in a complete NHB uh, type scenario, how effective are kicks and knees to a downed opponent? The reason that this is such a debated topic in MMA right now is because I think it is a very effective move. I mean, it's just as effective, if not more, than your regular strikes to the head, uh, you know, to a standing opponent or what have you. The setup's a little different, obviously. Um, you're probably going to use some degree of grappling to set it up, or you're going to at least knock the guy down to the floor in order to administer it. You know, obviously the guy has to be a grounded opponent in order for this to be considered the, a knee or a kick to the head of a grounded opponent. Now, of course, there are ways to counter it. You know, there's ways to defend yourself against it, just like there is for any technique in martial arts. I would say the one problem with it, though, is that if you can kick them or knee them in the head, there's a good chance that they can kick you or knee you in the head as well with, you know, up kicks or, you know, I've seen knees to the head from the bottom guy throwing the knees. Uh, just watch the Conor McGregor versus Khabib fight. So I think that, you know, it's not perfect, but it's definitely pretty top tier. So I'm going to put this at A. Uh, so knees and kicks to a downed opponent will be for A tier. All right. Another very debated topic, 12 to 6 elbow, the good old brick break. Um, one of the more ridiculous moves in MMA, especially when it comes to how it is interpreted in a live action scenario. You know, according to MMA, this is a 12 to 6 elbow, but this is not. Like, it, it makes no sense, but it is a very effective move. We've seen it before. Um, Travis Brown was known for these, even though it's not considered a 12 to 6 elbow you know, when he was using it, but it, it's pretty much the same thing. It's very effective. Um, it's good for defending takedowns. I would say it's one of the stronger clinch strikes that you could throw. Um, it's not any less applicable than, you know, any other technique from the clinch, but it's definitely not a technique that you can use in every scenario. And there's only a few times where you're really going to have the leverage to land a, a knockout uh, elbow. So I'm going to put 12 to 6 elbows at a B tier. Let's go with small joint manipulation next. A small joint is like your toes, your fingers. Some people consider the wrist to be a small joint, although I don't think it's considered a small joint in the sport of MMA. I think you are technically allowed to do wrist locks and ankle locks, obviously, in MMA. But the problem with trying to do a wrist lock in MMA is that you have a glove, you have uh, you know, 
a wrap around your wrist. So it's going to be extremely difficult to wrist lock somebody. So it's probably not going to work anyway. But I think that they definitely are effective. Um, you know, if you dislocate somebody's fingers or multiple fingers, it's going to make it harder for them to grab things in a grappling situation. It's going to make it harder for them to close their fists in order to strike you with. It's going to make it harder for them to walk if their toes are broken or dislocated. So I think it's definitely something that can be effective, but it's definitely not a fight ender. So um, I can't put it any higher than like uh, C tier, honestly. I'll, I'll put I'll put small joint manipulation at a C tier because I mean you can do some stuff with it effectively, but it's not going to win you the fight. I don't think. For some reason my picture is duplicated down here. Anyways, um, moving on. Next is hmm. What should we do next? Let's go with fish hooking. Um, fish hooking is basically taking your fingers and putting them in somebody's mouth like this and then yanking on it. And actually in the rule book, it is, you cannot put your fingers or toes in the orifices or orifices of other fighters. Um, so no, no fingering the hole. Um, in the case of fish hooking, which is like the most common one you're going to see, um, I guess it can be useful if you can manage to get your fingers in somebody's mouth without them biting you. And we will get to biting pretty soon. But I mean, if somebody, you know, bites your fingers when you try to stick your fingers in their mouth, um, that's, that's going to be pretty difficult to try again. But if you do manage to get that, you know, perfect fish hook and you, you manage to pull back and, you know, you could kind of tear somebody's mouth up like that, no doubt. And going back to the hair pulling thing, there's a measure of control that you can enforce upon that person's head and therefore upper body. And then with that control, you can use it to potentially set up a, you know, a more fight finishing move. So I'm going to put fish hooking at a low C tier and I'm being generous with that. Um, it's probably more like a high D tier, but let's, let's put it C tier. Let's be nice. I'm feeling nice today. So on the subject of biting, let's analyze how effective biting is. And I mean, I got a little picture of Mike Tyson biting Evander Holyfield's ear. And Mr. Holyfield definitely noticed that when it happened and did not appreciate it. And uh, did it kill him? No. Did it, you know, kind of sort of scar him for life? Yeah. Physically and probably psychologically. I think biting can be used more defensively than it can offensively. Uh, I don't think you're going to end any fights with a bite unless you like bite somebody's jugular vein or something. You're really just not going to kill them with a bite. But, um, you know, if you're kind of like stuck in a submission, like if somebody has your back and they're trying to get a rear naked choke, you know, possibly biting the arms, biting the hands uh, could help protect you. It's not going to help you escape from the position necessarily. You need to do that on your own uh, with grip fighting and and, you know, you need to roll out and stuff like that. But it could potentially be a deterrent against your opponent's offense. So I don't think biting is um, too bad of an idea, honestly. And it can kind of stem off of the small joint manipulation. You could, you could definitely bite somebody's fingers off. You could definitely bite somebody's fingers off. And then that would lead to, again, them having difficulty punching, grabbing, walking, all this stuff. So... I'm going to put biting at a low B tier. Next is the good old throat punch or throat grab. If I was to grab somebody's throat, grab somebody by the throat like this and uh, attack their trachea, um, and that's what the rule implies in the MMA rule set. It says that you cannot strike or grab the trachea of a person. That's what they're talking about, which is their windpipe. You can obviously see how that would be potentially dangerous, but the thing about um, the throat grab, it is fairly easy to counter, especially for a jujitsu guy. If you grab a jujitsu guy by the throat and you're in their guard, 
um, you might as well say goodbye to your arm forever because they're going to tear it off. You're really exposing yourself by putting that arm out there like that and trying to clutch at somebody's uh, neck. Yes, obviously you can choke them. You could potentially hurt or damage their windpipe by doing that, but the risk involved is a little bit too high. And as far as the throat strike goes, I mean, I've seen people hit in the neck before, uh, the side of the neck definitely, and sometimes in the front of the neck. I think it is possible to break the Adam's apple, although I've not seen it before myself. Every time I've ever seen somebody get hit in the throat, they were just fine. Um, and it's not an easy target to hit, especially against a guy who has like good fundamental striking where they keep their chin tucked and their hands up high. So, um, yeah, I don't think it's very viable. And, um, again, the potential to be countered is very high. So I'm going to put it at an F tier it, you know, about like a high F tier, let's put it, um, because you could conceivably win a fight that way, but I've never seen it. Let's look at grabbing of the shorts, and I got my picture of Venom MMA shorts because the UFC just did the Venom deal. It is no longer Reebok. We all see that when you grab your own shorts to defend against a submission, usually it's against a Kimura, it can be very helpful. And if you're grabbing your opponent's shorts, it can also be pretty helpful. It kind of stems off the hair pulling thing where you get a measure of control uh, over your opponent. In this case, it would be control over their lower body, control over their legs. Um, so you can kind of screw up their grappling, definitely. Uh, you can screw up their striking a little bit too. If you grab the shorts, it makes it harder to land like inside knees and stuff like that. So let's keep it simple. We're gonna put shorts grabbing at a middle of the pack C tier. All right, we're getting down to the last few things here. I know that some stuff duplicated down here, so it's hard to kind of follow what I'm doing here. But if you're still keeping up, uh, we've got two left. Let's go for another hot topic in MMA, eye gouges or eye pokes. Um, this is Ooh, man, this is a tough one because it happens a lot in MMA, despite it being illegal, because it's so easy to accidentally poke somebody in the eye. So if it's easy to accidentally poke somebody in the eye, then it must be easy to purposefully poke them in the eye, right? Not necessarily. Um, the eyes are a very small target. If you are purposefully trying to jab somebody in the eye, um, you're using, you know, very small parts of your body to strike a very small part of their body and they're moving around. Um, if you miss, you can be countered. If you hit their forehead instead of their eyes, you could potentially, um, damage your own fingers. However, in a grappling situation where you can get a hold of the person's head, um, and their face, it is a lot easier to eye gouge. You can grab them by the head and kind of use your thumbs to eye gouge them. And if, you, you know, we've seen what happens if you poke somebody in the eye, you know, real time, it, it can blind them. It can blind them for life. You could damage their eyes. You could pop their eyes out of their head. And if they can't see, they can't fight. So you can just take your pick of what you're going to actually kill them with after that. And of course, when I say kill, I'm talking about a self-defense situation. If we're talking about a no-holds-barred competition, um, the fight is over after that, obviously. So the fight ending potential is so high, and the permanent damage it can do is very high as well. It is quite applicable in a high-resistance situation. Um, there are some counters to it, but there, I mean, there's counters to everything. And um, it's such a a big problem right now in a lot of the MMA scene. I think, and I am I do this with reluctance, but I think I'm gonna put eye gouging at an S tier because, you know, you can you could potentially do it anywhere. You could do it from a farther range, although it's a little bit difficult to do from a far range. Um, you could definitely do it from a close range and you can pretty much end the fight instantly with it. All right, last one to go over is strikes to the back of the head. Now, of course, in the sport of MMA, um, everything is about 
pretty much hitting the other guy in the head more times than he hits you. So to say that strikes to the head of any part of the head is in any way ineffective would be silly, of course. I think there is room to debate how uh, potentially effective striking the back of the head is, whether it's something that would really, you know, kill somebody or not. Uh, from what I understand, being hit in the back of the head makes you more susceptible to knockouts. I don't know if it's like a softer part of the skull or what, or, you know, if it breaks more easily than the forehead. Um, I know the forehead is more dense, so um, I could see how that could potentially kill somebody, although we've definitely not seen it before. It's not something that happens a lot accidentally. But all in all, even if it's no more effective than a regular strike to the head, any strike to the head whatsoever is effective in MMA. So I think I'm going to have to put strikes to the back of the head, and that's a that's a picture of Ben Askren kind of hitting somebody in the back of the head. Kind of cut off the, the top part, though. I'm going to put that at an A tier. Uh, that just makes the most sense to me. You know, I just went back into it, and there actually was one that I forgot to mention. And it's a pretty important one uh, because it happens all the time in MMA. It is grabbing the fence. Now, grabbing the fence is kind of a big deal in the sport of MMA, um, because if you're not a very good ground fighter and your opponent is, and then you grab the fence, um, it could potentially prevent ending up in an area where your opponent has the best chance of winning the fight. Now, in a no-holds-barred competition, yes, it would be essentially doing the same thing, but then again, a no-holds-barred competition isn't necessarily going to be fought in a cage, and a street fight definitely isn't going to be fought in a cage. This could be summed up as just using your environment to like hold on and remain standing. You can also use the cage or your environment to hold on to somebody. A lot of times it's the guy that's pushing the other guy up against the fence and then holding the fence to kind of keep him trapped there. This one kind of goes along with the uh, hair pulling, the shorts grabbing type of mentality because you're using a certain grip to manipulate the guy's body uh, and where it goes. But the move itself isn't fight ending, and this one isn't even going to hurt anybody really um, or cause pain or injury. So I think I'm going to put it at the same tier as hair pulling and short grabbing, but I'm going to put it all the way down here on the very bottom of C tier. So I think I covered most of the illegal moves that make sense in MMA and how effective they would be if there was no rules at all. If I forgot any, uh, you know, just let me know in the comments. And if you think I got it completely wrong or completely right, just let me know in the comments as well. As always, make sure to like and subscribe and thanks so much for watching. Take care.